It's uh, our second in our Quest for Empire series. And uh, today, last time we took a nice trip to Tahiti, warm weather and all. Board, I board the bounty. <laughs> the mountain, yes. Sir. So, uh, well, I wasn't such a bad guy after all. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob is back to uh, share with us his history interest. He is a, indeed a history buff. He lives in Needham. Born in Maine, I just learned that little detail, and uh, studied at Babson. So he's an independent uh, lecturer now. He has a business of his own. Keep waiting for the call from Harvard. But <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> this is a start. Paul's putting all of this on cable for us, too. So Thank you, sir. You. Uh, and thanks to the friends for their sponsorship. The uh, also cable is here with Paul, and uh, I guess we're ready to roll. Thank you. Appreciate it, Marilyn. You know, when you look at the history of all of the conflicts and the wars America has been involved in, when you look at the War of 1812, you almost have to say, what could they be thinking? It, it just, when it was over, nothing had changed. England might have agreed to stop doing some things that aggravated us, but it, uh, it really begs the question of why did they think this was going to be a good move. 1789, there are two different political parties in America. The Republicans, led by Jefferson and Madison, are going to clash with the Federalists, led by Hamilton. One thing they both agreed on was foreign entanglements were not something the young Republican or the young Republic should get involved in. Jefferson, very, very much pro-France. Uh, he felt the spirit of revolution in France would grant France as a status as a second republic. He mistrusted Britain, didn't like the idea of the monarchy and the aristocracy. Uh, he felt America's growth, America's future should focus on agriculture. Didn't feel, didn't feel the love for big business, for shipping, for mercantile. Uh, endeavors. He thought that people in any country would thrive if they had no <coughs> aristocracy or no king. Now the Republicans, they strongly opposed Hamilton's proposals to raise money, to get the country on a stable financial basis, a central bank, to grow the economy via business and shipping. The Federalists were very much aligned with the British in terms of commerce, finance, and the economic system. Jefferson felt a Federalist government would have too much power and it would be likely to lead to corruption. The one other thing they did agree on was the habit of the British to stop American flagships, board them, and take American seamen off them to bring them back to England, the policy of impressment. This will fester for a number of years, and it'll actually be the straw, one of the straws that breaks the camel's back. The causes. Great Britain thinks we are ungrateful. They think we don't appreciate everything they gave to us. They think that we're rude. We just don't want anything to do with them in terms of government. Impressment of American seamen is going to be a cause of the war. Warhawks, this is a faction of uh, political leaders who are, their goal, their policy is to expand America westward. Henry Clay, others. And one of the problems they're having uh, with this program is the Indians. The Indians keep attacking settlements and the Warhawks are convinced that the Indians are being instigated and encouraged by the British presence in Canada. So their plan is, let's invade Canada and get rid of the British and everything will be okay. Uh, not, a very, not a very good move. Economic causes. England and America, the maritime industries were in strict competition with each other. And if there was one thing we need, one thing we knew how to do well, it was 
to build ships. It was to man them, to sail them all over the world for fishing, for shipping uh, construction. And we were, we were a very, very real competitor to, to the British. America represented one third of the market of all British exports. The U.S. merchant fleet in 1805 was growing at the rate of 70,000 tons a year. By 1810, it would equal one million tons of active shipping. Maritime industry in America employed 50,000 men. And this is in the late 1700s. It grew each year by 4,000 men. Exports generated a huge amount of money. In 1809, <clears throat> we had $9 million worth of exports. Two years later, we had, I'm sorry, 1809, we had $9 million. 1807, we had $139 million. It tapers off because of the uh, diplomatic rulings by England, the, the embargoes, the intercourse laws, and so uh, trade will plummet. But the thing is, trade was the ticket for revenue for the federal government because you had all these tariffs, all these, all these uh, taxes on cargoes coming in. At one time, uh, probably in the early 1800s, Salem, the port of Salem, generated one quarter of all the revenue for the federal government. So basically things were on the commission, the collision course between the two countries. France is trying to buoy their relationship with us and get us anti-British, but the French are also taking advantage. They're comp competing against us. In Europe, there's another problem, and that's the Napoleonic Wars. And that's starting to become more and more and more of an issue. England will look at America, the 18, War of 1812, almost as a nuisance, almost as a sideshow. Their real, real concern was the Napoleonic Wars. America will, we declared war June 18th, 1812. This is the, the white ensign. Only active ships and active duty stations are allowed to fly the white ensign. It is a symbol of the most powerful navy in the world at that time. In the early years of the 19th century, the Royal Navy was the most powerful navy in the world. She was the equivalency of today's Amazon. Hmm. Unparalleled. Only show in town. Her foes, all, her foes were constantly defeated, the, Brit uh, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish. The Royal Navy was the main line of defense for this island nation. England says, as long as Britannia rules the waves, we are free. Nothing can harm us. And rule the waves, she did. Between 1793 and 1805, 12 years, <coughs> In those 12 years, there were 14 battles between the French and the English. England would lose 10 ships. France would lose 377 ships. It was that lopsided. France would lose 23,000 men killed. England would have losses of 7,000. A lot of this was the due to the British tactic, which was, don't try to dismantle the ship. The French said, let's just try to dismantle her, and then we can have the ship, and we can take it over. The British said, forget it. Don't try to dismantle the ship. Kill as many men as you can. Kill them all, and then you will have the ship. A sense, <coughs> a sense of pluck, dash, Courage and British superiority was all that was needed. Lord Horatio Nelson stressed to his officers, close combat is best. This is the Admiralty Building. This is where all the decisions for the Royal Navy are made. The Lord's Commissioners meet every day of the year, including Christmas. It's probably a shorter work day, though. Than, than 
uh, I don't want to bore you with statistics, but here, at the start of the war in 1812, the Royal Navy consisted of 145,000 men. She had 187 admirals, 700 captains, 3,100 lieutenants. She had a fleet which consisted of 1,042 vessels, 720 were in active commission. Just on the American station alone, she had seven ships of the line and 31 frigates. That's the Royal Navy. American Navy on the same day had 20 ships hmm. under the leadership of 12 captains, 10 master commandments, com com commandants, 73 lieutenants, and 42 marine officers. So, you got a question. Do you really want to do this? Uh, the appetite for the Royal Navy, it was insatiable. They burned through men. They, they, they chewed up men. Constant demand for it. And it was partially fueled by the Napoleonic Wars. The Royal Navy grew from 60,000 men in 1803 to 145,000 men nine years later. They estimate 1,500 <coughs> men were, were invalided out every year while they were pensioned. Desertions, about 6,000 men a year. The desertions were what really pushed things to, to, the, uh, to the need for impressing, impressing uh, seamen. Nelson estimated that between 1793 and 1800, 40,000 men deserted from the Royal Navy. Why would you desert? Varied causes, but the major cause was it was a harsh lifestyle. You were surrounded by barbaric discipline, few benefits, poor food, low pay, long unbroken periods of being away from family, huge chasms between the social classes, between the commissioned officer and the lower deck seamen, there were miles of, of, of difference. Adding to these challenges were the relentless, never-ending presence of discipline. Life on board of one of His Majesty's ships basically reflected the social stratus of being ashore. This is a cat of nine tails. <coughs> Not a very good picture. This is the scale of a dollar. I don't know. I probably could get better on it. Discipline was everywhere. It was constant. Discipline in the Royal Navy basically said, <coughs> if you do this, this will be the penalty. They had the, what they call the Articles of War, and it was 35 articles. For example, one would be, if any man or if any officer or man in the Royal Navy appears to hold back and not give his full effort to defeating the enemy, he could be tried by court martial and sentenced to death. Popular way of implementing discipline was the cat and nine tails. There's a man here, he's tied to a hatch cover. This man here will be administering the punishment with the cat and nine tails. Over here you have all the men. Top side you have the Marines. Over here you have the officers. All the men have their hats removed. The officers and Marines do not take their hat off. The command of hats off indicated that the punishment was to start. And that was to remind everybody, the enlisted men, if you do wrong, this is what's going to happen. The fellow who would do the lashing, the whipping, was the boatswain's mate. That was his job. So if you had somebody on your ship, you would be the guy that would administer the punishment. There's another simulated uh, drawing of it. The number of lashes vary depending on the severity of the, of the, uh, of the crime. But it was also determined by what kind of a captain he had and some were more strict than others. There was a captain of a, a frigate, <coughs> guys, Captain Pickett, and he was, he was generally regarded as a tough, tough guy. 
and a squall came up one day. So he's got the men topside and they're reefing the sails. And he thought they were taking too long. He became impatient. Has a midshipman call up with a speaking tube. The last two men down are going to receive 25 lashes. Mm. This starts a pandemonium in a race up there. <clears throat> two men fall to their deaths. One of them lands 10 feet away from the captain. The captain walks over, kicks the body, and says, throw them overboard. In this particular case, that night, the crew mutinied. It was one of the very, very few mutinies. They killed the captain and every officer. They took the ship to a Spanish port. But the, you could, you could, you had such power over these men that no matter, you know, a midshipman, midshipmen are fairly, well, midshipmen are the lowest on the food chain of commissioned officers, but they're commissioned, they're going to be commissioned. A midshipman accused one of the men below decks of stealing his handkerchief. The captain brought him to, uh, to a court marshal and they sentenced this guy to 300 lashes. They give him the lashes. He's got like 110 and the, the surgeon comes up to the captain and says, no, you're going to kill him. You're going to die. He's going to die. He'll never, he can't take this. The captain says, very well. They cease the punishment, they let the guy heal, and then they give him the rest of the lashes. If you were guilty of a uh, mutiny or conspiring, or if you strike an officer, you would be put in a rowboat, and you would be flogged at, throughout the fleet. You go to this ship, the boatswain from that ship would come down and give you 25 lashes. You go to the next ship, and you would go through the fleet. It was absolutely brutal. It was barbaric. So you've got these, you got a lot of men deserting, you've got just new ships coming online, again, the constant need for, uh, for uh, manpower, and uh, where's my clicker here? You have the, the press gangs, and the press gangs are people that are sanctioned to go from one tavern, one bar, one brothel, places along the waterfront where there might be men, seamen, and you could gather them, bring them into custody, and they would be assigned to a Royal Navy ship. And the impressment, the policy of impressment, stemmed back to the days, back to the medieval days, when the king, if the king felt that the realm was in danger, he could summon every able-bodied man to defend the realm. And that's the grounds they had. Now, there was never any real legal implementation of it, but it wasn't against the law either. So, impressment is going to, uh, it's always going to rub salt into the wound. This is an example. It was an American flagged ship. It was a warship, the Chesapeake. And she was sailing along, and a British ship came up to her. The British captain had heard that there were some British deserters on board the Chesapeake, and they came up to her, and uh, they stopped the ship, sent their boat over. The British lieutenant goes, we're here to look at the manifest of the crew, and they have three men, and they take the three American men back to the British ship. And, <clears throat> and the, the American commander says, no, he said, you, you, no, we're not giving them up. This, these are American men, they're citizens and everything. This is an American vessel. The British lieutenant goes back to his ship and he tells his officer, no, they're not going to give them up. So the officer's fine, okay. The British ship opens fire on the Chesapeake. The British ship was the Leopard. And they, she opens fire on the American ship uh, in this complete pandemonium. The British ship is ready for combat. The American ship is just kind of, well, you know, while well, we left it going. They kill a number of American men. They subsequently come back on and take the three Englishmen and they, they uh, take them back to England, one of which is hung. This really causes problems in America. This is, the flag has been insulted. It's one thing to take, stop a, a, you know, a merchant ship, but this is an American man of war. So it's, 
this does not go well at all. And this is a, a, a picture of it. The Chesapeake and uh, the uh, Aleppo. Now we get to the good stuff. USS Constitution. Absolutely iconic ship. I don't, I'm not going to tell you anything about it because I know you all know about it, but she is one splendid warship. This is the guy who, his name is Isaac Hull, not necessarily an imposing figure. He's born in 1773 in Connecticut. His father was held prisoner by the British during the Revolution. Isaac grows up in the Derby Huntington area, which was active in shipbuilding. As a young boy, he goes to sea. At age 25, in, uh, in 1798, he's 25, and he's leaving the Merchant Marine. He becomes a lieutenant in the United States Navy. His first ship is the Constitution. There will be a long and storied relationship between Hull and the Constitution. He would serve in the Barbary Coast Wars, the Pirate Wars in the early 1800s off of, uh, off of North Africa. And he, he, he had a good reputation. He was considered an excellent mariner, a fair commander, and always eager to be at sea and in action. His advice to a junior officer, quote, above all, let me advise you to treat the men and all under your command with as much kindness as you can, as you can consistent with your duty, and do not punish anyone except as the law directs. So he's a very fair guy, honorable guy, well liked and respected. He also had some quirky beliefs. He thought that fresh fruit, nighttime air, and freshwater fogs were unhealthy. <laughs> In the Barbary Coast War, he would gain a lot of experience along with other junior naval officers. Uh, they called them Preble, Preble's boys, and these, these captains, Hull, Decatur, Bainbridge, Stewart, these guys are, all, I mean, it's almost like spring training for the young for the real full-time war, the Barbary Coast Wars. They're getting action, they're getting experience, and by the time of the War of 1812, they were going to be very formidable leaders. In 1810, 1810 he's ordered to command the Constitution. He's once again on board that favorite frigate. He's got to get her ready for sea. Now, on wooden ships, the minute they hit the water, Things start to wear and tear. And it's just constant replenishment. Mass sprung, rigging, spars, everything suffers. The Constitution hadn't, <coughs> hadn't had a significant, significant overhaul. She was in relatively poor condition. Her bottom was completely covered with barnacles and mussels, and they're hanging like bunches of grapes. Hull says, they're slowing us down. They bring her into fresh water. Uh, that kills a lot of the <coughs> a lot of the marine growth. Then they put her, they careen her, and they they're able to clean the bottom of the hull. They estimate they had ten wagon loads of shells were removed from her. This helped her become a much better sailor. So he's getting his crew together as a team. Uh, <coughs> One, one topic, one activity that he didn't like at that time was the uh, dueling. These young officers are just chafing at the bit, the action. And they just want glory, and they want promotion, and they want recognition. God forbid if they perceive an insult from a fellow officer. <coughs> So dueling is a problem. She's off the coast of New York. One of the men comes up, a sir, uh, one of the lieutenants comes up, and they, they request permission for the four of them to go ashore to shoot. Hall doesn't really know what they're up to, but he says, yeah, okay, go ahead. Well, 
They go ashore and they come back. One man was killed, another one was wounded. And Hull was furious. He has the man arrested, but there's nothing he could do. There was no regulation against it. In eight, before the War of 1812, dueling was a major cause of death for junior officers. Uh, 18 men died, four lieutenants and 14 midshipmen died just because of the dueling. He's working on getting the ship ready. They're becoming very, very uh, hot on it. It's a well-oiled machine, I guess you could say. The crew is happy. We're drifting towards war. War is declared. The Constitution is, Hull reads the Declaration of War on board the Constitution. The men ask for permission to cheer. He grants it. Three loud huzzas followed. He's going to spend several weeks getting her ready. <coughs> They're exercising the great guns. Officers are becoming familiar, acquainted with the men. Let me get a drink of water here. Constitution is outbound. She's headed towards, uh, she, she left Annapolis. She's going to try to hook up with a British squadron uh, coming home from the West Indies. Going to try to capture some British ships. July 5th, they're getting ready for action. The Hull writes a note to his father. Should anything happen to me, I leave but little, but it may be sufficient to make you comfortable during your stay in this troublesome world. Thursday, July 16th, lookout spot four ships which are sighted to the northwest. Hull approaches his bosun, Adams, and he says, Adams, what do you think of that vessel? Don't know, sir, replies the veteran tar. I can't make her out either, but I think she's an Englishman. So do I, adds Hull. How long will it take to flog her, Adams? Don't know, sir. We can do it but they're hard fellows on salt water. I know that. They are rather a hard set of fellows, sure enough. But don't you think we can flog them in two and a half hours? Yes, sir, said the bosun with all the coolness imaginable. Yes, sir, we can do it in that time if we can do it at all. Dawn of the next day is going to reveal a total of seven ships, four frigates, a ship of the line, a brig, a schooner, and they're all flying across of St. George. And they were all very, very close to her, not yet within cannon range, but there is no wind at all. 6 a.m. the wind has completely died, the British are gaining, and they're coming within cannon range, and Lieutenant, First Lieutenant Morris <coughs> says to uh, Hull, why don't we try kedging? And Hull goes, well, Tell me more. And what basically that was is they would put the anchors in small boats and they will row ahead considerable distance, drop the anchor, and use the capstan to advance the ship. And they would do this, uh, and it, it took a little while, but it starts to work. And the British don't understand exactly what's happening. But it gives the Constitution enough leeway to get out of, out of cannon range. And the Hull is one heck of a mariner. He just knows, he just, he's, he knows his ship and he knows how to get her moving. You gotta remember that these ships are significant items and if there's no wind, you know, how do you, how do you maneuver? He has 2,300 gallons of water dumped over to improve the trim. He has the men pump water onto the sails to stiffen the, the sails in case of any breezes. From midnight on the 18th, the wind finally picks up enough to allow the ship to be sailed rather than uh, towed. She gradually pulls out of reach from the nearest chaser. On the third day, a squall would, would develop, and this would give the Constitution a chance to uh, increase the distance. Finally, on the third day, 8.15 in the morning, the British would give up the chase. Captain Brooke was disappointed, as he told the Admiralty, 
<coughs> we had an anxious chase after an American frigate supposed to be the Constitution, but she escaped by very superior sailing, though the frigates under my orders are very remarkably fast ships. Monday the 27th of July, Constitution is back in Boston. Absolute overwhelming brilliancy in getting her away from the British. Uh, she's awaiting orders, but Hull is, he's worried, he doesn't want to get blockaded in, in town, in port. So he waits until August 1st, hasn't got any receive, hasn't got any orders, he says, I'm going to set sail. August 2nd, he gives orders to unmoor. 7 a.m., she's cleared Boston Light. He's going to go up to the Grand Banks. He's going to intercept some British ships up there. On board the Constitution, the Articles of War were read to the crew. But, you know, there's a lot of tension. On the 19th, she sights a ship. And it turns out this ship is a British frigate. It's the Guerriere. <clears throat> the Guerriere is a little a little smaller than the Constitution. The British would always claim the Constitutions were super frigates. The British would claim that, you know, yeah, it's an unfair fight. But you have to remember, at this time, none of the British ships have been defeated by the Americans. So, you know, things are going along. She sees the Guerriere, and uh, she closes. She gets closer and closer to her. Now, the Guerriere is commanded by Captain Richard Dakers, and he's a very competent, capable, confident guy, and he says, uh, he sent a letter to the captain of another American ship inviting him to uh, a duel. He says, uh, Captain Dacre is commanding his Britannic Majesty's frigate Guerriere, 44 guns, invites you and your ship to meet with the Guerriere for a brief day to day. Everything's very, very, you know, very polite and everything. Three o'clock, both ships are getting closer. <clears throat> Dacus questions an American prisoner on board. He, he, he's trying to figure out what ship that is. Prisoner says uh, she's definitely an American ship. Dacus goes on, he says, uh, she comes on too boldly for an American, but the better he behaves, the more honor we shall gain by taking him. General quarters, constitution, the men are there. They're in the fighting tops, the sand is spread on the decks, powder boys are running to and fro, the midshipmen are standing by their division, the gunners are at the ready, hull is full of energy, and yet he's calm. Goes through the officers and the men, then he urges them, do your duty. No firing at random, look well to your aim. Five o'clock, Gary Air fires a single shot to gauge the range. Gets a little closer, she fires a full stop at broadside, all the guns on that side. Hull holds his fire. And the British realize that they're not doing any damage. Their shells are actually bouncing off the ship. And that's where you get the saying, ha, huh, huzzah, her sides are made of iron. So take is gets closer. Six o'clock, an hour later. Constitution still has not fired. <clears throat> Lieutenant Morris goes to Hull and he says, permission to fire, sir? No, sir, not yet, said Hull. <clears throat> I'll tell you when to fire, so stand ready and see that not a shot is thrown away. At 6.05, both ships are very close along. Hull gives the order, slow down, slow down. And then he goes, first division, fire. The next, sir, pour in the whole broadside. Now, boys, pour it into them. In a matter of seconds, broadside of over 700 pounds of metal pours into the guerriere. The entire ship shakes from bow to stern. Splinters fly as high as the top of the mast. Broadside after broadside is poured into her. Hull is standing on a chest. He sees things are going right. Shout, by heaven, that ship is ours. During the incitement, during the excitement, he split his white uniform breeches from the waist to the knee. And he carried on. Fifteen minutes later, the mizzen mast, the aft mast, falls on the Guerrier. Constitution crosses her bound. She's firing 
It's just mayhem for the British. Guerrier gets entangled with the Constitution. They're trying to have borders. Both ships want to send boarding parties, but the sea is so rough they can't do it. Meanwhile, the men on top of, and the fighting tops are firing down. Lieutenant Bush says, shall I board her? And he's instantly killed with a musket shot to the head. Uh, Lieutenant Falls, Hall tries to get the men to board, but the sea is too rough. At 6.30, the Guerrier breaks loose, but she's got no mass. She's just rolling like a log, completely dead in the water. She fires one single gun away from the action. That's a signal of surrender. The whole battle lasts 25 minutes. During this engagement, Constitution fired over 100 rounds of canister. That cylinder is packed with bullets, bolts, nails, rusty pieces of iron. And these were very, very effective. The Guerriere, her hull, she had over 30 holes in the hull. Six feet of water, six feet of the uh, side of the ship were blown away. There was five feet of water in the hold. She's just completely useless. The butcher's bill, the casualty list, Guerriere, 15 dead, 62 wounded, and another 24 men missing. They were missing when uh, some of the mass fell over. The losses on the Constitution, seven killed, seven wounded. On board the Guerriere, carnage is everywhere. Bodies of the dead being thrown overboard, bits of skulls, legs, arms, blood all over the place. Some of the men on the Guerriere went below and they broke into the spirits locker and they're raging drunk. The wounded are brought to the Constitution below decks and American surgeons are operating on them. One American seaman, his name is Richard Dunn, he's facing the amputation of his leg and he looks at the surgeon and goes, you're a hard set of butchers. Captain Dacus is rowed to the Constitution. He presents his sword, his sword to Hull, who refuses him. I could not accept a sword from so gallant a foe. He then invites Dacus to his cabin for a glass of port. Dacus says to Hull, what have you got for men? Hull responds, only a parcel of green bushwhackers. Dacus responds, bushwhackers? They are more like tigers than men. I never saw men fight so. The next day, explosive charges were placed on the guerrier and she is set afire. At a little past 3 p.m., she exploded and sank. Charles F. Adams, Jr., a historian, cited the exact moment of America's birth as a world power at 6.30 p.m., August 9, August 19, 1812, the moment, the moment HMS Guerrier struck her colors to the Constitution. Constitution makes it back to Boston. She's, they're just totally, they're, they're heroes. They're celebrated, there are plays, there are parades, there are dinners, everything. They are just riding the crest of the wave. This is the first victory of an American frigate against a Royal Navy frigate. It's, this is, really, this is, nobody saw this coming, at least none of the British did. So Hull is going to receive all sorts of presents. This is a sword that he got from the, the, a grateful community. Here it is again. This is a tea set from the citizens of Charleston, South Carolina. Hmm. This is a, a, an urn. I mean, these things are absolutely beautiful. There's pictures of them in that table. What happened Where? to the crew of the British ships? Uh, basically, good question. They were taken prisoner, but they were released, I think. Yeah, but they had, I mean, they had very, very heavy cases. Okay, so here we are. This is Bainbridge. Okay. Bainbridge takes command. Bainbridge, uh, if, if Hall was if, if Hall was well respected, uh, the crew loved him. The crew would do anything for him. They'd go the extra mile. None of that's going to happen with Bainbridge. Bainbridge is a head case. He's, he's not a nice guy. Uh, he has a checkered past. <coughs> His ship. <coughs> was captured, he ran his ship aground off the coast of uh, North Africa, and the Barbary pirates captured it. 
and you know it's been one cluster after another. So, but Bainbridge takes over, and uh, the first night, two men try to desert. Bainbridge threatens to have the entire crew in irons, uh, but he says, if, "I'll let the two guys go if you guys agree to fall in fall in line." So, they said, "Okay, fine." Prize money. Bainbridge is, is, is always looking at the numbers, and one of the uh, incentives is if you capture a British ship, there's prize money. So he takes his ship <coughs> to sea. December 29th, they are uh, sailing along. They spot a British ship, HMS Java. Java is on her way to India. She's got the new governor of India and all his staff. Uh, Capable crew, capable leadership. The Constitution engages her. The, the crew of the Constitution was, was much, much more practiced with guns, exercising. They always got the great guns. Uh, the British, a lot of the British ships didn't fire them that often in terms of training because of cost. Mm -hmm. Long story short, he, uh, at 2 o'clock, the two ships engage. and. Bainbridge is wounded twice, slightly. Uh, it's back and forth. Java tries to board the Constitution. The men are shot and cut down. Java loses two mass. She's rolling heavily. Her captain is killed. By 4 p.m., the battle started at 2. By 4 p.m., she surrenders. 22 men killed, 102 wounded. Constitution, 12 killed, 22 wounded. On the uh, Constitution, her lifeboats, her cutters, her launches, seven out of eight were destroyed. Uh, it was just it was a very, very intense battle, but the Constitution prevails. She's blown up January 1st. These are just, these are prints showing the destruction. Uh, she's blown up January the 1st. Bainbridge did receive $7,500 in prize money from Congress. Each sailor and Marine got 50 bucks. So, you know, it's corporate. <laughs> Last guy, Charles Stewart, captain. The uh, the Gary, the uh, Guerrier and the Java. There, one was J August 12, uh, 1812. The other was January, December 31st, 1813. Nothing good happening. 1814. Nothing good happening because the, the the numbers are now coming into play for England. She's now blockading every port along the eastern seaboard. So you've got American ships that can't get out. So when they do get out, it's almost like they they're running like hell to get it to escape. And then, once they're on the high seas, they stand a chance. The Constitution is, uh, Captain Stewart is her commanding officer. It's February 1815. She's been blockaded for eight months in Boston. So you've got these ships that are doing nothing. Meanwhile, England's getting more and more and more control. The Constitution uh, runs into these two ships, the Levant and the Cayenne. Basically, she, they, if they had worked together to attack her, probably it would have been a far more even fight. They kind of attack in two separate uh, directions, and the Constitution prevails. She uh, heads back to Boston in May. She's welcomed as a darling child, quote unquote. She struck the first and last blow in the unhappy contents, says the Salem Gazette. Now. It's the Royal Navy's term. This is Captain Philip Bowes Vere Brook, but he spells his name B-R-O-K-E. He's born in 1776. He is the epitome of a successful, well-bred English officer. Quote, Brooke was everything one could hope for in a good post-captain. A tall, stalwart figure, 
a calm, kindly and devoted man, a firm disciplinarian with the ability to inspire trust, confidence and loyalty in his offices and men, a superb leader and a first class fighting seaman with a keen and inquiring mind. Such was Philip Bowes Verbrook, the creator of that splendid fighting ship, the Shannon. The Shannon is his ship. He has had command of the Shannon since 1806, a new frigate, fast, 150 feet long, rated for 38 guns, but capable of carrying many, many more. Now, Brooke was a man who placed great emphasis upon naval gunnery. A lot of his peers simply advocated, not just blast the hell out of him, and sooner or later you'll hit something, and you know, volume and firepower is great. Brooke said, no, you, let's be scientific about this. He developed sites that would help the aim. He worked on the art of naval gunnery. He actually paid out of his own pocket for a lot of the guns, a lot of the cannon that would, uh, they would use in practice. He would develop systems and implements which would lend science to firepower. Is another thing he spends a lot of time on. He places great importance on drilling and practice in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 1812, the war broke up. He had spent many years in the Royal Navy. All he wanted to do, he was very public about this, all he wanted to do was have one engagement with an American ship of equal size, bring honor to the flag, and then he would go home and retire to his country uh, as a country gentleman on his estate back in Suffolk. Brooke is the guy in charge of the British squadron that the Constitution escaped from at the beginning of the war. Time is just racing by and nothing happens. But he finally realizes and finds that the American vessel Chesapeake is in Boston. He knows she's in Boston. And he's outside the harbor. The Chesapeake was the ship that the British took American, Englishmen, American off before the war started. Chesapeake is, is she's not a bad luck ship, but she's not a good luck ship. Her captain is James Lawrence. Lawrence is a dashing young naval hero. He has had success against British ships in some minor engagements. Lawrence is in Boston, and the one thing Lawrence wants to do is to get out and do battle. That, you know, combat, battle, engagements, those are the things that determine where you're going to be in, in the scheme of things. On June the 1st, 1813, she would sail from Boston Harbor to meet the Shannon. Brooke sent a letter to Lawrence inviting him for a tete a tete. He says, I promise you, it'll be only my ship. I won't have any other British ships. It'll be my ship and your ship. Uh, so he sends a letter to Captain Lawrence. Here's a surprise. The letter never gets to him. It gets hung up in the post office. But Lawrence doesn't need it. He, he, he wants to go. And he just is waiting. So he comes out. It is, it's, it's a perfect day. Chesapeake is followed by numerous small civilian vessels filled with onlookers. This is his wife, the lovely Lou. Oh, his, yeah, this is his estate in Surrey. Well healed. I mean, truly a gentleman. This is Lawrence. Lawrence was a rake. He was a handsome guy. He was a bony bomb. People loved him, but so you got these two very, very strong personalities. Here's a picture of the Chesapeake. Chesapeake left Boston. She was followed by numerous small civilian vessels filled with onlookers who were looking forward to another single ship American victory. Perfect weather, a slight breeze, brilliant sunshine. Both ships were evenly matched, on paper anyway. Brooke had a very well-trained and seasoned crew. His officers were very experienced and they were well aware of his leadership style. Lawrence had a crew which was probably capable. His officers were much, much newer. 
some of the, the senior officers were sick at the time, and he's got a ragtag bunch of officers, but, you know, you go with what you got. The gunners on the Chesapeake were relatively green in experience compared to the gunners on the Shannon. Again, the Shannon, her crew is <clears throat> miles ahead of a typical British ship in terms of gun experience and training with the great guns. Once the Chesapeake is closing the distance and Brooke realizes, yep, they're coming out, he calls the, the men to quarters, get ready for action. Surgeons are below decks, they've got their tools ready, knives, forceps, drills, tourniquets, buckets half filled with water awaiting amputated limbs, sand all over the decks. The sand is to absorb the blood. It was always the purpose. Any warship at that time, before that, you just covered with sand. <clears throat> Buckets of water are available for fire. All the men are at their battle stations. Marines are in the fighting tops. Officers are at the ready. Brooke had the goats taken from the manger and thrown overboard. That's a real sign that things are getting dicey. While the Chesapeake is still several miles away, he calls the carpenter and he says, put up a screen here, a canvas screen between the quarter deck and the rest of the ship, and set up a table. And he says, we want the good silver and claret for lunch. The enemy, the enemy is approaching. They are coming out to try to kill you, and he says, get the good silver yeah. and claret. They have lunch. Oh, the, the canvas is not to hide from the enemy, it's that the men don't see what's going on. <laughs> and at the end of lunch, Brook stands, he says, an old custom, I ask all of you, take wine with each other and shake hands before we go to our quarters, which they do. 5, 10 p.m., Brook gives the orders to the men, throw no shot away, aim everyone, keep cool, fire into her quarters, main deck to main deck. Don't try to dismast her. Kill the men and the ship is ours. Silence. Silence is in order. Go quietly. Don't cheer. It's better to hear the orders. This is the beginning of the engagement. What happened was the Chesapeake's coming out of Boston and the Shannon is headed on this course. What people expected that would have happened was the Chesapeake would have come across the stern and fired, breaking her. But for some reason, Lawrence decides, no, we're going to go man to man, and they, he pulls up next to her. And that was a huge mistake. 546, and this is not going to take long, 546, Chesapeake approaches. 5.48, two minutes later, she declines to cross the stern and she aims for the starboard quarter. 5.50, gun number 14. If this is the Shannon, gun number 14 would be here, number one would be here. Gun number 14. Brooks says to the gunner, as soon as, she, as soon as you see her chains pass your field division, fire. And what happens is it's perfect once he fires, and the Chesapeake continues every gun downstream fires, and it's just lethal. At 5.54 and to 6 o'clock, the battle's raging. Lawrence is wounded. He's carried below decks. He says, don't give up the, don't give up the ship. That, you know, that quote resonates hundreds of years later. Keep fighting. Don't give up the ship. The broadside, the first broadside between these two ships, the distance, 50 yards. The second, 20 to 30 yards. And these cannons, I mean, and the, when these rounds would hit, the wooden splinters, I mean, were jagged, they would fly everywhere. The smoke, you can't see, things that it's just devil. Brooke orders the men to uh, board the ship. And 
the Americans also tried to board. They're trying to board the, the uh, Shannon. And you can see how close they are. I mean, they, they're literally 10 feet away. And so boarding is when push comes to shove. That's cutlasses, that's axes, that's knives, that's pikes, that's guns. Is a hard way to die. And this is where it really manifests itself. Here's a picture of Brooke. He gets a saber wound about four inches in the head. Uh, here's another picture of them. These are, you know, somewhat artistic renditions. But at the end of the day, the uh, it's, it's a mismatch. Some of the common seamen on the Chesapeake are uh, hiding down below decks. It's, uh, the Chesapeake has 70 killed and 77 wounded. Shannon had 34 killed and 50 wounded. Uh, she's taken, the Chesapeake is taken as a prize into Halifax. And there's a picture of her here, and she has the American flag, but on top of it is the Royal, or the Royal Ensign. Uh, Lawrence dies, takes him, well, takes him three days to die, complete agony, and uh, he's buried in Halifax with full military arms. Uh, he's later brought, uh, dug up and brought back to, uh, to New York, and then I think to uh, a third time to Annapolis. Uh, Brooke was just, you know, he just knew what he was doing, and it was, you know, training discipline were what you had to have in those days. Luck was not really a factor. The war ends uh, shortly after the, the British have completely blockaded the American Navy and uh, you know I'm not a professional historian but basically there were probably five bright spots in the war at sea for America. Uh, the war on land with the exception of the Battle of uh, New Orleans, the war on land was a total disaster. And if that wasn't bad enough, everything we tried to do in Canada was just dismal failure. And the war was over. And you know, it was like, what did that, if anything, accomplish? But it did get the attention of the Royal Navy. You know, I mean, it was, it was, uh, they were absolutely thunderstruck to lose three engagements to this one ship. So, sorry about uh, okay. this. We can uh, have a few questions, though. Why did Paul not keep uh, the USS Constitution? Why did they keep the Good question. Uh, there were more captains than ships available. And the seniority Hull wanted to stay on the Constitution, but Bainbridge had a slight edge in seniority, hmm. uh, which was, you know, I, yeah, Bainbridge was, I don't know, he was not a, I mean, piece of trivia for you. You know the movie, a couple of years ago, there was a movie uh, about the Somali pirates, Captain Phillips. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. So the Phillips is in the, uh, the man overboard boat yeah. with two or three Somalis, and this destroyer is following him, and the destroyer, the shopshoot is finally killed, the uh, Somalis. The name of the destroyer, Bainbridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody else, please? You've been really patient, so. <laughs> How you. many British, uh, sorry, American ships were there in the total Navy at the time, roughly? At the, uh, the day war was declared? Yeah. 20. So we talked only basically about two. Yeah. What happened to the other 18? What were they doing? <coughs> Uh, one of them was the Wasp. She did good. She beat a British ship called the Frolic. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the Essex uh, was successful, but she was more of a commerce raider, and she was in the Pacific, the Southern Pacific. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. The Constellation was not that starry. So they weren't trying to try to help break the blockade then, these other 18 ships. No, no. they, so they were somewhere else on the way. <coughs> yeah. Oh, they're way out. Huh? Yeah, they were somewhere else because if they tried to break the blockade, the, the, the numbers just, you know, wasn't going to happen. So they just gave up with the blockade. Well, they, the blockade yeah, and they said, okay, well, 
they're blockaded, but we're going to attack here, or we're going to try to attack this convoy. Oh, you know. See, it, yeah, it wasn't about territory per se. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So when the Const Constitution first met that a group of seven British ships, and they did their maneuvering, they got back to port. Why were they regarded as such heroes? It seems all they did was escape. <laughs> <laughs> because it was almost a guaranteed certainty that she would not escape, that, that she would be captured. Hmm. I mean, it was, it's not, I mean, they were just very, very grateful. And it was all because of seamanship. You know, the boats that, <coughs> the boats that she would lower, that were row ahead, drop the anchors, and then they winter forward. All of those boats, there are probably four or six of them, all of those boats were picked up on the fly once the wind picked up. They didn't have to slow down or anything. So the seamanship and the maneuvering was spectacular. The British didn't even try. They just left those boats there and said, we'll come back and get you at some point. He didn't lose a man, he didn't lose a gun, he didn't lose anything, so. I mean, it, it, it was. And, and the accounts for these battles were so specific. Was that people just filling in details or were there people recording, um, was there like journals or? Um, I think probably a combination of both. Yeah. I mean, there were always, like any time a ship was lost, even in the world, if a ship was lost, and you know, you go, how the hell would anybody know what's going on with smoke and fire and explosions? They can, they, they get every, all the survivors, yeah. piece it together and, and, and try to find out what there was. And you also have the viewpoint of the victor too, or whoever won. Like the British would see it this way, the Americans would see it this way. There were some embellishments on either side. Um, how did the ships find each other on the ocean? <laughs> well, they, they would know of the routes, the trade routes and everything, uh, but it was simply, well, we think the convoys, you know, I mean, there were specific routes that are, uh, from Halifax to England that British ships would take, from yeah. England to Bermuda. So they, they kind of knew, particularly, you know, Americans knew how to find things on the water. They, they were good on the water, so I think they just knew the general direction and they'd go out looking for them. <coughs> and was it, I don't know, when, when uh, the Constitution approached those four or seven British forces, that seems a, a little bit of a, of a mismatch. Like, why would the Constitution approach so many British ships? Well, they weren't. There were, it was a, a complete, she wasn't going after them, she was going along and she, <clears throat> she did not know where they were. She was headed in this, <clears throat> in this direction. <clears throat> and uh, it was just, they just, oh, look at what we have here. Because she didn't even know there were seven when she first spotted them, a couple of them. Mm -hmm. Nighttime came, the next thing, you wake up in the morning, and, you know, you think maybe there's two or three in the seven, so. <laughs> did the uh, British, uh, <clears throat> Captain on the on the Shannon, go back to his Holy Shoal. Oh yeah, yeah, he went back. Yeah. Uh, so they took, they finally broke the Chesapeake up, and they built a, a tavern out of some of the wood in, in England. And uh, yeah, there's a little bit of the story there. He went back, lived a long life. Very, very healthy uh, resistance. He healed, you know, was going healed and everything. So, yeah. You talked about the two captains, by the way, they, they send letters to each other. I mean, was this <coughs> on land letters? I mean, or they sent a boat with a little. Well, they sent a boat in with a, with a letter to the, to the postmaster. The you mean into shore? Yeah. Or it wasn't like, okay, I'm out on one ship, but I'm out on the other. Yeah, so no. They get no, a boat and they send no. a boat to the yeah. other. Well, I mean, they could do that, but in wartime, they wouldn't do that. I don't but think. so they send the boat to shore. Well, they weren't that far off the shore, though. And then, I mean, but from the shore, and then they got to send another boat back up to the oh, other yeah. boat? Yeah, well, labor's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. 
that weird. Sir. You mentioned last month about the punishment, like 300 lashes. Uh -huh. You mentioned it this week. Was, it, was the bounty, I can't remember, in this 1812 close in time, was something that just lasted a long time? Those, those punishments that you were talking about. The punishment, did it last a long time? Oh, the punishment? You mentioned the 300 lashes yeah. last month. Yeah. And you mentioned the same, the same type of punishment. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the, the discipline. So this was 1812, right. 1813. The bounty was 1789. But there was, it was, okay. it, it actually, the, the uh, you know what? I don't know if the Royal, the Royal Navy must have eliminated flogging. But I think it was there probably. Was a mutiny in the, in the fleet. Yeah. Yeah. In, 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 yeah, because there were, after the mutiny on the bounty, there were a, a couple other mutinies, widespread mutinies. And they weren't mutiny, they weren't going so much against the command structure, they were going, from my understanding, for better conditions, mm -hmm. better treatment. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was no uh, flogging in the American Navy. I mean, I think it was for a very, very brief period. Anybody else? Excuse me, did they exchange prisoners or how did yeah. they look? Okay. Yeah, they would exchange prisoners. Hmm. Uh, there's some pictures and stuff there. That, I'm sorry about this. That was. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.